Imagine you've been charged with a crime, okay? For the sake of this example, let's say it's something very, very extreme. You're a serial killer, and your actions have been on camera, and you have a court date coming up, and your lawyer is preparing you for your defense, preparing you for court. You're not an expert in law, so you're gonna defer to him and follow his guidance on uh, how to try to get through this. So you listen very, very carefully, and he lays out the instructions of what you're gonna do to make it through this. So here's what you gotta do. Starting a month before the court date, your lawyer tells you, I want you to start preparing yourself, and I want you to start working on improving your behavior. Okay, try to take a, a moral accounting of your actions, think about ways that you can improve. And most importantly, try to cut down on murders throughout this month <laughs> leading up to the court day. You know, maybe you can't go cold turkey, but try to slowly reduce your murders. And try to make a plan, and this is really important, on how you're gonna murder less in the future. And the court date's approaching, and we're getting closer, we're getting closer, and he says, you need to be on your best behavior. There's no playing around anymore. The judge has the FBI watching your every move, and the judge will be very disappointed if he finds out you've killed more people before your court date comes. Don't forget, your, your life's on the line over here. Be kind, be generous, be loving, be a good person. And now the court date finally comes, it's the day of, wake up in the morning, lawyer calls you up right away and says, under no circumstances are you to kill anybody today. This, this is the court date, no more games. No matter what, you gotta control yourself. You're going to court, you gotta be really friendly. Hold the door open for the person behind you, smile at people, say good morning, compliment people, just be the best person you come. The prosecutor is called to testify. There's a giant video screen. All he's gotta do is press play, and there's just video camera, surveillance after surveillance, showing you killing somebody. That's all he's gotta do to make his case. Big, high definition screen. He shows it all out for everyone. And then your lawyer is called to the stand, and, and it's his turn to try to pre and, uh, present your defense. So he gets up and he says as follows, Your Honor, my client knows, the defendant knows that you are the highest judge over this county, over this jurisdiction. Your authority, your leadership are, are totally undisputed. No crime escapes from you, from your scrutiny. But my client also knows that you're kind and merciful and forgiving. My client is in awe of your authority, but absolutely confident that you're gonna dismiss this case. And you're gonna exercise nothing but mercy over him. I also wanna point out that my client has exercised a tremendous amount of self-control over the last little while. He has not killed a single person today. He's been trying to cut down on his murders over the last month in preparation for this, for this big trial. Look at him and you'll see a good person, a kind person, a generous heart holding the door open for people. Look at him right now, he's smiling, he's happy, he's, uh, he's getting along with people. After this, after this court date is over, he's actually gonna go home and he's gonna host a huge banquet for all his friends. He's gonna serve wine and meat and all kinds of delicious food. You see, he's a good, he's a good person. And he's gonna celebrate the fact that you're going to dismiss this case against him. And one more thing, Your Honor, my client requests that you help do whatever you can to ensure him a year of peace, of prosperity, of wealth, and happiness. And that's the case he makes. So after that initial court date, let's say in our example, the jury is deliberating for 10 days before they're gonna issue their final verdict. On the 10th day, you get up and you take a stand. And you go through all these charges that are against you, and one after the other, you know, they go through count one, count two, count three, count four, et cetera. You openly admit that you are guilty to every single one. And you say that out loud and you say that clearly. And you express remorse for your actions and you feel bad over what you've done. And you promise the judge that you will never kill again. And all the while you keep reiterating your belief, your absolute belief 
that first of all, he is the ultimate judge and he is the highest in, in, in the district. And also that you're con confident that he's gonna be merciful and kind and let you off the hook and then pull whatever connections he can to give you a year of, of wealth and a year of health. What's, what's the ending to this story? <laughs> what's the end of this story? You get acquitted of all charges, you give your lawyer a, a handshake and a hug, that's why he gets the big bucks. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. Probably you wouldn't see the light of day again, and probably the lawyer wouldn't have another client again. But is that not what we're doing, Rosh Hashanah, as we prepare for Rosh Hashanah? The whole year, we're, we're spiritual serial killers. The whole year, we mess up. We make mistakes. We slip. We sin. We do things God doesn't want us to do. And now the month of Elul comes, and it's 30 days before Rosh Hashanah, which is the day of judgment, and we start improving our behavior. You know, slowly over time, we try to improve. We try to do more and more. There's a little more urgency maybe as the day of judgment is coming, as Rosh Hashanah is coming itself. And then, of course, on Rosh Hashanah, whoa, then we want to be on our best behavior. No, no sinning on Rosh Hashanah. Everybody knows you don't sin on Rosh Hashanah. I mean, that, that's not a good idea, right? So Rosh Hashanah actually comes, and, and we're doing our best, and... And hopefully we're, we're praying in some way, going to shul, doing, doing some way of, of connecting to the, to the holiday. And we go into shul, and what do we say in shul? We declare that Hashem is our king, and that he is the highest of, of all authority in the world. And he is the final say. He has jurisdiction over everything in the whole world. We beg Hashem for his, for his mercy, but we just keep reiterating that he is the highest judge, and we express confidence in the text of the prayer that he's gonna that he's gonna acquit us of all charges and then we go home and we party we go home we have a great festive holiday meal we have meat we have wine we invite friends we sing songs we're having a good time and then afterwards we have another 10 days that leads up to they're called the 10 days of repentance leading up to yom kippur and yom kippur we have the final chance to make our case and that's the first time we actually address our crime, so to speak. That's the first time we actually open up and start talking about the things that we've done. But instead of trying to defend ourselves, as, as any lawyer would, would do, it would be a defense of why you either didn't commit the crime, or you did, but it's not as bad as it looked, or some other technicality that we're going to get you off on and why you, know, you shouldn't be charged with the, with the worst of all charges for the actions you've done. We, we don't even touch that. We don't, we don't go anywhere near that. Instead, we're told to clearly, openly articulate and confess and say every single thing that we've done wrong. We, that's what we do. In the text of the prayer, there's uh, common ones that are, that are popular, the popular sins that we all list, because we know in some way or another we've probably touched upon them. We could you know, go beyond that and, and speak out things that we know we've done for ourselves. And we just openly admit to everything, and we express remorse over what we've done. We try to realize you know, what our actions have done or where they, they've led us, and we commit to, to not doing them again. And that's the whole process of tshuva. That's what we're doing in Yom Kippur. But what kind of, of ridiculous defense is this? That this wouldn't fly in, in planet Earth, that's for sure. What, what is happening on Rosh Hashanah? What in the world is happening? Are we being judged for actions we've done? If so, what does it matter if we're improving or on Rosh Hashanah we're on best behavior? If we're lucky and we're really dedicated over the month of Elo leading up to Rosh Hashanah, we're, we're improving our behavior. How, how does that fix anything? How does that give us a, a good judgment on, on, on Rosh Hashanah? So obviously, it goes without saying that luckily God doesn't use the same system. Okay? Thankfully, Hashem does not use the same system as, as the courts do in this world to figure out what our year is going to look like and, and what happens on Rosh Hashanah. So there's a few different things we could talk about. Like, what's the difference? There's a lot of differences. We could talk about, we could talk about how uh, God's world of sin and mitzvah, like mitzvah and sin, is not so black and white. It's not just do bad, get bad, do good, get good. There's a lot of, of nuance to the way Hashem set up our life. It, uh, the actions we do are not just about did you do it or did you not do it. It's also about what is the background to the action? What is the life circumstances that you find yourself in, which almost basically always is a result of 
a, a system that God set up that wasn't even your choice? What is your intent while you're doing the action? Again, good action or bad action? What are you thinking? What's the thought process? Was there a greater good? And, you know, there's, there's a million different uh, nuances that go into this system. So it's not just like this black and white reward system where you have points that you're counting up and you get minus points and you get extra points. Okay, so there, there's, there's truth to all that. I'm going to leave that aside for now. We could also talk about Teshuva. We could talk about, obviously, there's a different system here. In the court system, if you express remorse, it might help you an ounce, a little bit, might help you a little bit. They'll probably get a worse sentence if you don't have any remorse. If you're in prison and you have enough remorse after enough time, maybe it'll get you out early. But essentially, the action is the action, and you, and you pay for what you've done. But in Judaism, we have this unbelievable concept called Teshuva. Unbelievable idea that I could repent from my sin, and all I got to do is is say what I've done and, and face the music and not hide from it, and I need to express uh, remorse that I feel sincerely, authentically in my heart, and I need to make a real commitment not to do it again. But at least it, we have this concept of tshuva. It erases sin. Not only does it erase sin, if it's done the right way, if it's done out of love, we're taught, it could actually transform sin into merits. However, that's a, that's a hard thing to understand. But... The point is that somebody who sins and then comes back to Hashem is in a very, very high place. Our sages teach us that in a place that a Baal Tshuva stands, somebody who, who sinned and came back from his sin, even a righteous tzaddik who's been righteous his whole life can't get to that level. So there's definitely something, you know, something very, very powerful about Tshuva. Instead of trying to deny what we've done, we, we face up to it, we, we confess it, and... And we have this concept that Hashem forgives us for that. Okay, but even that, that's not even the job of Rosh Hashanah. That's a, that's a Yom Kippur activity. On Rosh Hashanah, we do not do Teshuva, which is pretty, pretty interesting if you think about it, because it's the day of judgment. Why are we not doing Teshuva? Shouldn't that, that be the main day that we do Teshuva? Is the day that we're being judged and our year is being decided? So we know Yom Kippur is the ceiling of the verdict. Rosh Hashanah is when the, you know, our year is written out, and then we still have... You know, some sort of appeal. We have 10 days until Yom Kippur to really make our case, and that's when we focus Yom Kippur on, on Teshuvah. All right, but what are we doing on Rosh Hashanah? So that's what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on a new perspective. I think, you know, for me, I found this to be a very fresh perspective about Rosh Hashanah is all about and what we're doing here. On Rosh Hashanah, we crown the king. That's what we do. We crown the king on Rosh Hashanah. We declare that Hashem is the king over the world. What does that mean? On Rosh Hashanah, we ask for life. Zachreinu l'chayim melech chafetz b'chayim. Remember us for life, king who desires life. What kind of life are we asking for? What are we, what are we looking for? We want to live a, a full life. We want to dive beneath the, the facade of this physical world, of this very material physical world. And we want to live a life of being close to our source, to the source of our neshama, to Hashem. We want to start seeing the spiritual parallel to this very physical world. A fulfilling life means my soul is connected to its source, and my soul is achieving, or at least aiming towards achieving, what its mission on is in what its mission is in this world. And everything around us screams the opposite of that. And, and our body and everything we have, all the physical you know, pleasures we have and the world we live in and the responsibilities we have, everything is, is kind of pulling us away from that. And that's the ultimate battle between body and soul. But our, our goal is to live with Hashem, to be close with Hashem. And the way we do that is by following in His ways, by, by mimicking Him to an extent. We're, we're following in, in His ways. We can follow the things that he tells us to do as he instructs us in the Torah how to live the best possible life we can. We can avoid the things that he tells us to avoid. We, we carry him around everywhere we go, everywhere we go. He's in our heart. He's in our life. We want to see him in our life. We want to live a life of closeness to Hashem. That is, that is our goal. That's the type of life that we're asking for on Rosh Hashanah. And of course, we need to live. We need to quite literally live through the air, and we need to have the material things that we need in life. But all of that is all for the purpose of living our, our soul life. 
So of course we need to ask for physical things because without uh, our physical world being set up, then we can't connect spiritually. So that's why it's the foundation of it. But that's the type of life that we're really asking for. We want to be plugged in to our source. I want to say life is like, like a phone. Life is like a smartphone. You need a plug in to recharge. What happens if you don't plug in your phone? Your battery dies out. You know what happens if your battery dies out? You ever put your phone on power saving mode? If you don't charge your phone and you want to keep a little bit of life, you turn it on, scroll down from the top, hit power saving mode. And then your screen goes black and white. And then you're limited to like four apps. You call, you text, uh, maybe an alarm or, or email or, or something simple like that. that. That's what it's like to live in a, in a limited capacity. When we don't plug in, we see the world like we're in power saving mode. And we might, and, and the irony of this is we might see that this is the whole thing. It's like, wow, this is so cool. I see pictures and videos and calls and texts. And it's like, yo, you haven't unlocked the, the massive world that's hidden behind the, the power saving mode if we would just plug in. We plug in, we reconnect our source, and then we see the world in, in vivid color. Then we unlock all the features, all the features. So imagine if we're in power saving mode and life is good, and life is good, imagine what life is like in full color, in full HD, unlocking all the features that Hashem really sent us down here to do. We need to fill up. We need to connect our neshama to its source. And when we do that enough, just to take this analogy of the phone one step too far, then we can use power sharing. You know, power sharing is a very cool feature. If your phone has enough battery and you have a compatible phone, you just touch it to the other phone and you can actually recharge somebody else's phone wirelessly. That's what happens. Somebody who's fully charged, he gets power sharing superpowers. And now people come near him and they see his fire or her fire and connection to Hashem and that just spills over and, and, and is given over to other people as well. We have so many opportunities to plug in, to plug in our phones, to plug in our souls. We, we are guilty of missing many of them. That, that is for sure. So Hashem hid himself in this world very, very well. And the only way to give us a fair shot is by giving us endless opportunities to plug in. So he gave us them, and they're, and they're everywhere. And there's a lot of examples of that. There's a lot of examples. Plugging in means seeing Hashem in this world and connecting to Hashem. So every single mitzvah is there to bring us closer to Hashem. There's hundreds of mitzvahs. Every single one can give us the opportunity to recharge. Every time we exercise self-control, and refrain from some kind of sin, some kind of do not, that the Torah says, we're, we're powering up. We're connecting our neshama to its source. And sometimes, and sometimes it's worse. Sometimes we get to the outlet and, and we don't even plug in. Imagine, imagine bringing your phone right up to the charger and then just leaving it next to the charger, but you forgot to actually plug it in. That would be the mitzvahs that we do <laughs> without any sense of, of presence, without being aware of what we're actually doing. So you can do a mitzvah in a, in a check the box type of way and find yourself not recharging from it and wondering, wait, wait a second, what's going on here? I'm doing mitzvahs. Why am I not recharging? Why am I not feeling more of a connection to Hashem? That's, that's what happens when we do things just because we think they're the right thing to do or some kind of social pressure or synagogue pressure or who knows what, whatever else, whatever else you know, plays a role in, in just wanting to check some kind of box. And that's the most frustrating thing in the world because if you know the mitzvahs that are out there and you know what you can do and you do them and, and you're not getting anything out of them, that's, that's very painful. That's a, you're holding the key and just like, don't know how to insert it, don't know how to punch in the code. That's, that's, that's very stressful. That's very painful. And, and that's something that I think we're, we're all guilty of in, in some way or another, is not knowing how to use that key. So we need to learn how to, how to use that key. We need to learn how to find mitzvahs to be things that bring us closer to Hashem, because that's why they're there. That's why they're there. It's not just some funny system where Hashem says, I feel good when you do this and this action. That's like, 
That, that's, that's ridiculous. Hashem is perfect. Hashem doesn't need us to do things to make him happier. He gives us mitzvahs to, for our sake, for our benefit, to make us better people. So mitzvahs bring us closer to Hashem. That's really the, the, the inner world of mitzvahs. Mitzvahs bring us closer to Hashem, which means averos, sinning, takes us farther away from Hashem. One step further, teshuva, repenting from our sins, brings us back closer to Hashem. And that's why it's the, it's the theme of the month. That's why uh, Elul, the days leading up to Rosh Hashanah, is a time for, for looking into ourselves and trying to fix our ways and the 10 days of repentance and leading up to Yom Kippur. Of course, it's all, is, all about teshuva because teshuva is the antidote to sin. Closeness is the antidote, antidote to distance. So that's why the external actions of Yom Kippur and the days leading up to it is going to be the three-step process of confessing our sins, speaking out what we've done, feeling regret, and committing to, to a better future, committing to, to not do them again. But that's just the externals. That's just what that looks like. That's what you have to do in order to get to that place. But really what we're doing is we're telling Hashem, I want to come close to you. We're saying, I know that I've created distance. My actions, or sometimes lack of actions, has created distance. But now I want to come close for you, to you. And that's why even one step is, is a big deal. It's not about resolving every issue we've done. It's not like we've left behind this like world of disaster, and now we have to go and work through every single crime that we've done. We've created distance. We need to go and, and strive for closeness. So Rosh Hashanah is a day of telling Hashem, I want to be with you. I want to be close with you. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to resolve everything. We're going to do the best we can to, to work through any sins that we've done through teshuva. But the heart of what we're doing is taking a step towards Hashem, saying, Hashem, from now on, I want to live a life of closeness to you. That's the resolve that we make on Rosh Hashanah. And that's why Rosh Hashanah is just about crowning the king. It's not about dealing with all our actions. We're going to do that after Rosh Hashanah. But it's about crowning the king. It's about telling Hashem that I recognize that this, there's so much more to this world than I see, and I want to start living a, a soul life. And there's a lot of different levels of that. And I want to just speak out, I'm going to speak out three of them, but everyone can find themselves somewhere in between and sometimes kind of dancing from one to the other and back again. We're all human, so, so we all do that. So the, the most physical level of existing in this world is failing to see the spiritual world that we live in. And that's the, the, stat, that's the default status quo. You're not a bad person if you don't have a, a keen sense of spirituality in this world. That, that would make you, I believe, a regular person. Everything about the world screams this is a world of nature. That's kind of the default. But if you're Jewish, for sure, for sure if you're Jewish, you have a neshama, you have a soul, and that soul is going to have a void because that soul is only happy when it's connecting to its source. So no matter what, there's going to be a void in the soul if it's not connecting to spirituality, if it doesn't feel closeness to Hashem. Now, what do you feel that, that void in? And I think we all feel that void. It's just a matter of how often and how intense and, and what that is. But even if, you're, if a person is not feeling it, it doesn't mean they're the most spiritual people. It just means that their body is doing a, a fine job at, at repressing the void. Or they're looking, they're looking, they're looking for something. They're looking for some way to express that around the world. But there's no hiding the fact that the Jewish soul is always going to crave closeness to its source. Even the biggest, most righteous tzaddik is feeling a craving of wanting to come closer to its source, close to Hashem. So that's kind of the default. That's kind of where we start with. And then we need to work our way up. So the next level will be, I crown the king. The next level will be, I have a, an awareness of the spiritual world. And I, I see this world of nature, but I also know that, it, that it's a facade. And I recognize that there's a creator to this world. And I know that there's, this, there's a facade of what's called kochi v'otsim yadi, which means my strength and the power of my hand. It looks to me like I am doing things that are having results and I do actions and results come and I work and money comes and I 
do this and health comes and it looks like I am independent in my world and I'm the one who performs and results come based on a very you know, surface level uh, world of nature. But I know, at least I know, deep down, I know that, that Hashem is everything. And I know that I have no existence outside of Hashem. And I know nothing will happen to me if it's not the will of Hashem. And I know that my purpose here in this world is to connect to Hashem. That's what I'm here. That's what, that's what my purpose in this world is. So in Rosh Hashanah, I crown the king. It's kind of, I rededicate myself to that belief. I'm not, I'm not, you know, we're not perfect all year. Nobody's perfect all year. It's a very hard level to always see Hashem in every moment in our life is, is a lifetime of work. But on Rosh Hashanah, I rededicate myself to that belief. And I sit there and I say, I know the whole world, it's all, the whole year, it's all about me, but now it's Rosh Hashanah and I'm, and I'm expressing to you, Hashem, that you are the king. I'm crowning you as king because I know that that's who you are and I know that you're running the entire world. But even that, that is, a, that is a very special way to connect to Rosh Hashanah, but there's a higher level than that. There's a higher level than that. And this is the ultimate goal of Rosh Hashanah. And it's, and it's hard to get to but it's worth speaking out and it's worth just knowing that there's a goal to get to this place. Okay, that is a place where you realize that Hashem is a king, but Hashem's kingship has very few followers. Ein melech below am. There's no king without a nation. So Hashem is the king, but so many people in this world do not see Hashem as king. Billions of people in this world Billions of people don't see Hashem as king. And many millions of Jews do not see Hashem as king. And that bothers me. That pains me. The, the kingship is missing so much. The kingship is missing so much of so many people don't see Hashem as king. And that matters to me. And, and that's it. That, and, and now, the fact that that matters to me is so real that I'm going to pray to Hashem on the day of Rosh Hashanah Please bring the day where we can say the Yeda Kal Yitzor Ka'ata Yitzarta, that every creation will know that you are its creator. That is a very central theme on Rosh Hashanah. It matters to me that so many people fail to see Hashem. And that's it, and that's what I'm here. And I could be doing so much more to plead my case on Rosh Hashanah. But I'm totally ignoring all the needs that I have, and I'm even ignoring the need to do tshuva right now. And I'm focusing on this, on crowning Hashem as king and asking Hashem to bring us to a day that everybody can see that truth to themselves. Now, it's, it's hard to get there. It's hard to get there. And everybody's on their own level within this whole spectrum. So Rosh Hashanah is a day to take one solid step closer to Hashem. One step along. Wherever you are in the spectrum, one step along, one step closer to Hashem. That's all Hashem wants. He doesn't want us to try to do more than we can actually achieve at any given point in time. But I, I would just end by encouraging everybody to think about these ideas a little bit. Sometime between now and Rosh Hashanah, find the time to, to tune out the distractions. Think about these ideas. Think about how you can make a plan to take one step closer to Hashem this Rosh Hashanah, and, and I, I, I challenge you to try to hit that highest level. How can we bring ourselves, like internalize the void of the fact that Hashem's presence is concealed from this world? Think about that and see if you can get it to a moment, one moment of, of pain over it, one moment where you say, Hashem, this is so, this is so not right. This is so not right, so many people don't see who you are. Please bring that day. Bring the day where we can say, Every single creation will know that you have created it. And that's the goal. I think if we can get to that for one flash of a moment, we've done an incredible job.